Well, as I said, the past few weeks, we've been talking uh, about prayer, and we've been looking at some of the different prayers the Apostle Paul actually himself prayed. And, and I'm challenging you to, to add these prayers to your own prayer life, um, because the reality is, most of us, I, I think, know this, we, 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 we're basically the kind of people, a lot of us, who say, I know that I should pray more, but, right? Uh, a lot of us, that's the case. Uh, I know I should pray more, but I don't, or, but I forget, or I just don't get around to it, or I don't, don't know how to do it. And, and the reality is a lot of us don't always know what to pray for. So we are in the process of learning some new things to pray for, some things that the Apostle Paul himself prayed for. Now last week we committed to praying that all of us would be active in sharing our faith. And the reason that we are praying that we would be active in sharing our faith, Paul says, is so that through doing that, by sharing our faith, we would have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. See, when we begin to share our faith, we, we, we begin to grow spiritually. Uh, a lot of us intellectually want to say, I want to know all the answers before I begin to share my faith. But, but Paul says that's not the way it works. Paul says begin to share your faith and then you will begin to grow and have more of the answers along the way. And so Paul challenged us to, to begin to pray that sharing of our faith. And today we're going to look at a prayer that Paul prayed uh, that, that, that's very, very close, in fact, to a, a prayer that Jesus also prayed. And, and I, and I kind of, you know, me at least, think if, if, if Paul prayed the prayer and if Jesus prayed the prayer, then I, I certainly want to pray this prayer as well. And the contents of this prayer revolve around the idea of unity. And that's going to be where we're going to hang out. And the rest of today is talking about this idea of unity. Unity in the, the family of God. Unity in the, the body of Christ. Because, let's be honest. Unfortunately, today in the world, Christians are not always the most unified group of people. In fact, I, I would argue even that that uh, one of Satan's greatest schemes is to intentionally divide the body of Christ. Why? Well, because if we're united, we're, we're basically an unstoppable force, right? We, we can do for the glory of God uh, amazing things here on earth if, if we're working together. But if we're divided, uh, we're deluded and, and then we are weak and, and we're ineffective in the ways in which God would want to otherwise use us. So today I, I want to dive in on a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed that, that really addresses the importance of the theme of, of the family of God being unified. Now why? So that the reason we are unified is so that we will glorify God. When Paul prays these prayers, one of the things we're seeing is that every time he prays a prayer, he says, so that. And he tells us why it is we pray that prayer. And today it is so that we would glorify God. And this is what Paul prayed, Romans 15, 5 through 7. Here's his prayer. Paul says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring, bring praise to God. So his prayer is that, you know, would you, would you, would you treat others like, like Jesus treated others? Would you think about others like Jesus thought about you? Would you, would you love others in the same way that, that Jesus loved you? He says, I want you to have the same attitude of mind toward one another. The attitude that Christ Jesus had. Why? So that we may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 7, and we'll come back to this verse in a little bit again. He says, accept one another. Just as what? Just as Christ has accepted you. In order to do what? When you do this, you bring praise to to God. If you want to glorify God, if you want to bring praise to God, what we do is, is, is we have to treat each other as Christ loved. We accept one another as Jesus accepted and loved us. This is what Paul was praying for. Why? Again, so that 
we would glorify God. Now, as I said, Paul prays this, but Jesus also prayed this. And I'm going to kind of steal from a future sermon here because we're going to tread into the book of John a little bit again coming up soon. But, but, but Jesus has a similar prayer in John chapter 17, 20 through 23. These are the words of Jesus. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Paul prayed for unity. Jesus prayed for unity. Why? So that God would be glorified and so that the world would know that God sent Jesus to reach the lost and the broken. May we be unified. This is part of what we as followers of Jesus should be praying for. That that for the rest of our lives as Christians, I hope that you are praying that God would strengthen us, that God would knit us together, that God would give us unity in the body of Christ. Why? Again, so that God would be glorified, so that the world would know that Jesus was sent to show and share His love. And and I I ask myself, why is this so important to God, right? I mean, Paul prayed it, Jesus prayed it, this must be pretty important. Well, I think the reason this is important is because sometimes, as Christians, we're our own worst enemies, right? We bicker, we fight, we spin our wheels arguing over things we really shouldn't be arguing over. Sometimes we see other Bible-believing churches as our competition. Sometimes we even say bad things about them and secretly hope that they fail. I know I've had that said about me in my church. And we need to recognize we have an enemy whose mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal the unity of the family of God. To kill the power that unity brings. To destroy the credibility that the local church stands upon for Jesus Christ. And when we recognize Satan's tactics when we stand together we can do infinitely more together for the glory of God than we can do apart that's why we need to pray we pray that we are unified why? so God can be glorified and the world will know that he sent us Jesus in order to, to motivate you uh, more, to help you become mo- more intimate in your prayer life with this, with God, I want to give you three different reasons why, and you'll see those in your sermon notes, three different reasons why it is that we pray for unity. The first reason, if you're there taking notes, is simple. We pray for unity because we desperately need one another. We desperately need one another in the family of God. Paul said it this way in Romans 12, 5. He said, Just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function, so that it is with Christ's body. In other words, the hand is not the ear. The ear is not the esophagus, right? We have separate parts. We are separate parts. But they all have to work together. They all have a special function. And without one of those portions, we are incomplete. And then he said this, he said, he said, we, he said, we need to do this, meaning the followers of Jesus. And we are many parts of one body, together, one body. We are part of a, a broader family. We are, we are different, of course, by design, and that's intentional, that's God's plan. We need to understand that portion about unity. Unity is not the same as uniformity. Those are different things. Now, this doesn't mean we abandon discernment. There, there are groups out there that, 
that, that certainly we can't play ball with, unfortunately. Groups who might call themselves churches, but they're not preaching the same gospel. That's not what I'm talking about. We do have to still be discerning. But that said, there are other Bible-believing churches that we can be for, that we can cheer on, that, that we can have strength despite having difference. And it is our, our differences, in fact, that give us the ability to reach more people. Because here, here's the deal. I know this as a pastor. I don't care how hard we try, Glory Baptist Church can't reach every person in Aiken County. We can't reach every person for Christ. We can't. I wish we could, but that's not reality. We can't. Now, I think we should try. I think we can make that our goal. I think we can keep working in that direction. But the reality is we are not able to reach each and every person for Christ. We have to be able to identify who we are, what we do well, and then let that guide us. Other churches, they do some things differently, right? And it reaches some people that we can't. And that's awesome, as long as they're reaching people for Christ. It's a lot like fishing, right? Most of you know I'm in no way an accomplished fisherman, right? But, But it's a very good biblical metaphor, so pastors like to use it nonetheless. And there's a reason tackle box exists, right? Now, some of you guys with like 12 tackle boxes, you may be going overboard here. But there is a reason tackle boxes exist. I mean, can you imagine having to reach just blindly into a bag to pull out fishing lures? You know, you'd come out with some new piercings, right? Which might be cool depending on where you live, but... I don't think that's your ultimate goal when you're trying to go fishing. We have tackle boxes so we can safely store the different little spoons and lures that that we use when we're fishing. And any good fisherman knows it takes different bait to catch the fish. All sorts of things play into this, right? Weather, water conditions, the type of fish you're fishing, the phase of the moon, the insect hatch, so many other things. There's so many. It's such a complicated formula trying to figure out what fish are biting on. And, and in the morning, they might be biting on this yellow spoon, and then, then the next in the, couple hours later, they're biting on something completely different. You're fishing the same area with the same fish, but they've changed their minds for some reason, right? What's up with that? But we know that in fishing, we have to have some different things to put out there in front of them. And, and we as a church can't be each and every lure. It's just not possible. So thankfully, there's other Bible-believing churches out there doing what God tells them to do and doing it well. And that's a good and an awesome thing because it brings glory to God. So we want to cheer for them, support them whenever we can, however we can. Because together, together I believe, we can reach everyone in Aiken County. Together, we can spread the gospel across our country. Together, we can share it with every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. But we can't do that alone. So pray that because Paul and Jesus prayed it. But pray this also because we can make a difference in this world. Pray this so that God would be glorified and that all would know that He sent us Jesus. Pray for unity. Now the second reason we do this, you see this in your notes, is very simple. So that the world would see God's love. When we are unified as the family of God, the world sees demonstrated in real life this this active, passionate love of Jesus in his family. In fact, I I love the imagery of Romans 15, 7, when Paul says along with his prayer, he says this, he says, Accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Right? In fact, there in in the Greek, there's a word that's called prosolambano, a long word. It's got a prefix, a suffix, and you cram words together in Greek, and it gets confusing, and you don't need to know all that. But but it's a very picturesque word. 
It carries with it the imagery of when you accept someone, that you are literally, the picture of it is receiving them into your arms and embracing them. When you accept somebody, it's like giving them the warm hug, the greeting. We're not talking, you know, the man with the backpack, all right? That's, that's not what we're talking. We're talking about the bear hug kind of greeting. Okay? And then it has a further illustration within it that, that not only do we give them this hug, but it's as if we, we embrace them with this bear hug, and then we go walking off together holding hands with one another. It's that, that kind of acceptance and bonding and unity that Paul uses in this word there in Romans 15. So when you accept somebody just like Christ accepted you, how did Christ accept you, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ accepted us. Before we agreed to anything, before we were perfect, which we still aren't, of course, before we had everything together, Christ accepted us. And that's what we do with other followers of Jesus. We accept one another, and then hand in hand, we walk together and embrace one another. And there's, oh, there's nothing more frustrating for a pastor than when somebody who is hurting, somebody who's broken, somebody who is lost, comes into a church, and then, then they find judgment and criticism and gossip. And in my many years as a pastor, I've run into so many people where that was the case, where I'll talk with somebody and they'll eventually find out that I'm a pastor and then I'll get to hear their story of how they were wounded by some, somebody in some church somewhere because, you know, in their moment of vulnerability, they, they went and kicked the tires and somebody kicked them, right? And now again, I don't think we do that a lot here. I think we're pretty good about this. But we have to be cautious and careful nonetheless, lest... We will trend in that direction. The church is to be a heart hospital for the brokenhearted. This is to be a, a safe place for people with questions and with doubts. A place where you don't have to be perfect to fit in. A place where you will know that you will be loved. In fact, Jesus couldn't have said it more clearly then in John 13, 34, and 35, he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. There is only one description in the Bible about how the world will know that we follow Jesus. There's only one description in the whole Bible. You know what that is? It's if we love one another. If you love one another, the world will see it and know. And that's why we need to pray. We believe that, that God hears and answers our prayers. We believe that our prayers matter. We believe that if we humble ourselves and we seek God and we pray, that He hears and He answers our prayers. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we're not going to pray small and general prayers. We need to pray big and specific, faith-filled, pr passionate prayers to God. And it takes faith to pray for a very divided church. Not this church, but the capital C church. It's a global church. It takes faith to pray that God could unify us to His glory. We need to pray for that. We need to pray for that because the world is watching and the world will see God's love when we work together. The third thing is, in your notes there, this is one of my personal core values. And it is because with unity, we can do infinitely more together. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I don't think the government can save us. I don't think some social program can save us. I don't, in fact, think they can even begin to fix us. Half the time, it's part of the problem. And that's not a criticism of our government or any government. That's a criticism of all government. 
the way the world will be resolved, the way the world will be fixed, the way the broken will be healed, is through Christ Jesus and Him alone. There's no other way. It is through Him. And I pray that we would pray towards that. And this was... This was the very heartbeat. This was the attitude of the early church. If you read the book of Acts, the development of the beginning of the early church, the first century church, this is what they were about. Think about it. What did they have back then, right? They had no building. They didn't have a church to go to. They couldn't worship and celebrate at the temple because as Christians, they were outsiders. And in fact, were being persecuted oftentimes in the early church by the Jews. So no buildings, they didn't have a radio or television ministry, no fundraisers, no special campaigns. They had persecution. I mean, and and we're talking real persecution. We're not talking about somebody was tweeting bad things about them, but people were trying to kill them, right? People were, were killing pastors. And yet, the church grew and the church thrived. And yet, the followers of Jesus were able to spread the gospel across the entirety of the globe. That is one of the things we need to be praying for. That God would work in us like he did in the early church. And I want to show you how it was described early on in Acts 4. That's such a powerful image here. Luke describes it this way in Acts. He says that all believers were one. That they were of one heart and one mind. And what does that mean? It means they were unified. They were all one heart and one mind. And if you know the story, you know that that no one claimed their possessions as their own, right? But they shared everything that they had. That's crazy love, right? That's like the next level of love. That's commitment to the family of Jesus, unlike anything that I've ever really honestly experienced in full. and, And honestly, haven't really lived it out all that well myself, frankly. I mean... We want to be known as people who would give you the shirt off of your back, but when somebody comes and asks you for that shirt, you kind of go, oh, am I ready to give it? And in the book of Acts, we see this crazy love. These crazy people loved God and loved people so much that they would actually take their possessions and basically sell them and give the money to the church and say, hey, give this to somebody who needs it. They trusted the church better to disperse it than they did themselves. That was crazy, unified love. And by God's grace, God did an amazing work and the church began to thrive and grow despite massive persecution. Do you see the power of God in unity? Every need was met in the early church through the family of God when they didn't see themselves as individual Christians, but they saw them part themselves as part of the family of God, part of a body that needs one another. And they wanted to demonstrate that love of God that recognized that they love one another just like Christ loved them. Imagine us doing that, living out in radical ways Christ's love. When people see that and they go, what are those crazy people doing giving all that money away? What are those crazy people doing serving? They could be doing something else. They could be at home taking care of their stuff. Instead, you're out here serving. What are you doing? Why do you do this? The world begins to ask questions when they see us act differently. We can't act like the world, though, and expect them to see us. We'll just blend in. We have to be different. So we have to learn as we pray for unity. And how, how can I take it to the next level and love? others as Christ loved me. Many people around the world and in our community as well who are far from God are are already familiar with the concept of the love of Jesus. They've heard the story of Jesus. They know what it is about Jesus. What they haven't experienced and what they haven't seen is somebody actually living that love out. When we live love out, 
it oftentimes can speak louder than the words that we might use. We still need to preach the gospel. We still need to use the words. But a lot of times, our entry point into telling somebody about Jesus isn't with words. It's with service and with love and with generosity. When we go and we serve and we love our neighbor, when we forgive rather than get revenge, when we respond in love, even though we're the one who's been hurt. When we don't put our own needs first. And in so many other ways. When we show love, when we respond in love, when we offer loved, we act as Christ acted. For each and every single one of us. He loved us before we even knew we needed his love. And when we do this as a church, when we do this as a capital C church throughout global church, I believe amazing things can happen. And I want to see that. So I'm going to begin praying for that. But it's going to take a commitment by us to work towards that. And it starts with our prayers. I believe it will start when the church begins to pray. And when the church begins to stand together and when we don't take shots at each other and when we believe that God has called us to be part of his family, I believe God is going to do things that will blow our imaginations away. So let's pray for that this week. And then let's pray for that every week, for the rest of our lives, that God would bring us together, that we might do great things to his glory. Amen? Let's pray.